Hello, and welcome to Eastern Roman History. On Saturday the 19th of August, 797, Emperor Constantine VI was blinded and spent the remainder of his life in prison. Now his mother, Irene the Athenian, became sole emperor of the Romans, and was the first woman to ever hold that position. As the first female emperor, her political position was extremely vulnerable, but had support from both the army and administration who were fed up with the inept rule of Constantine VI. She healed the Mokian Schism, the estrangement between the Patriarch Tarasius and the influential monks of the Studios Monastery, Theodore and Plato, over the illegal marriage of Constantine VI to Theodote. Irene defrocked the priest that presided over the marriage, Joseph of Cathara, and after releasing the monks from jail, negotiated a reconciliation between the monks and the patriarch. Theodore was subsequently appointed abbot of the Studios Monastery by Irene. I would like to thank my generous patrons for their support, and if you enjoy this video, please like and subscribe for more content about the late Roman and Byzantine Empire. Stay notified using the bell, and now let us continue. She took several steps to establish herself as the sovereign, Coins were minted with her portrait on both sides. Official documents used the title Basileos instead of Basilissa. Moreover, she revived the legal practice of writing novellae, or new laws, rather than the Isaurian practice of issuing legal codes. She also appointed her reliable eunuchs, Sterachios and Aetius, as her two agents but both plotted against each other, eager to succeed Irene when she died. Almost like clockwork, a plot formed in the palace to proclaim the half-brothers of Leo IV as emperors. Aetius acted quickly and exiled the brothers to Athens. In 798, the caliph launched an offensive, which reached as far as Ephesus and sacked Malagina in the Opsician Strategus, capturing the imperial herd Sterachios' stables and many prisoners. The Count of the Opsicion and his army were ambushed and slaughtered by the Arabs. Irene negotiated for peace and agreed to pay the 160,000 nomismata per year again. However, there is some scholarly debate as to whether this treaty actually occurred or not. Once again, conspirators in Athens were discovered trying to release the half-brothers of Leo IV. Irene ordered her nephew, Theophylact Sarantapekos to blind all of the imperial brothers. In 799, Irene fell seriously ill. She had not chosen her successor. So, Storacius and Aetius started plotting against her. Irene recovered, but Aetius and the Domesticos of the Scolae informed her that Storacius was plotting against her. She reprimanded Storacius, but in the next year, Storacius was emboldened and wanted to make himself emperor. Eunuchs, not having the ability to sire children, were naturally excluded from even the possibility of being emperor. However, Irene's own break with precedence potentially paved the way for him to do the same thing. He bribed elements of the excubitors and scholae in order to rebel and be proclaimed emperor. Fortunately for Irene, Sterachios fell mortally ill and died in AD 800. Irene gave out generous gifts and donations to charity and churches to buy support for her body and soul. She exempted the church from taxation for all of its lands and tenants in an enormous gesture of charity. Irene continued to hand out charity and also abolished trade tariffs in Constantinople. Theodore of Studios mentions how she lifted maritime tariffs, road taxes, mountain pass tolls, taxes on fishermen, hunters, and all sorts of artisans and traders. Additionally, the customs houses at Abydos and Hyron were also given tax exemptions, which were substantial because they were both important trading ports on the Hellespont and Bosphorus. Abydos itself being an important slave market. Although, Claims that Irene bankrupted the state are grossly exaggerated, since she managed to store up a cash reserve which she later showed to Nikiforis I. 
On the 25th of December, Pope Leo III crowned the King of the Franks, Charlemagne, as Emperor of the Romans. The Pope ostensibly took the decision because for him a woman could not be Roman Emperor, the culmination of decades of increasing disassociation with Constantinople. The coronation of a Western Emperor of the Romans further damaged Irene's tenuous authority. Charlemagne planned to attack Sicily, but changed his mind and decided to marry Irene instead. The marriage was designed to settle the dispute between the two emperors. However, the proposal caused considerable uproar, with Aetius being one of its most determined opponents, especially since he was planning on seizing power. Aetius had been busy. He appointed himself Strategos of Obsicion and the Ernatolicon Strategia, and appointed his brother, and intended usurper, Leo, as Monostrategos of Macedonia and Thrace. In 802, Charlemagne offered to marry Irene, and she planned on accepting his proposal. With Irene's failing health, the Frankish proposal, and Aetius planning to take power, a group of conspirators leapt into action to depose Irene. On the night of the 31st of October, 802, the Logotheti of the Genicon, Nikiphoros, the Domesticos of the Scolai, Nikitas Trifilios, and his brother Sicinios, Leo Sarantapekos, the Quester Theoctistos, Gregory the Patrician, Peter the Patrician, and several other Tagmata officers seized control of the palace and captured Irene. Theophanes describes in great detail what happened. Arriving at the so-called Calcae Gate, they quickly tricked the guards by convincing them that they had been sent by the empress to proclaim the same Nikephorus emperor because the patrician Aetius was forcing her to proclaim his own brother, Leo. The guards gave credence to this egregious lie and joined in proclaiming the usurper emperor. Thus the patricians entered the great palace, and from there they sent throughout the city some insignificant people and slaves to make the proclamation before midnight. They also placed a guard round the palace of Eleutherios, where the empress happened to be. At daybreak, they sent for her and confined her to the great palace. Thereupon, they processed to the great church to crown the wretch. All the populace of the city gathered together, and everyone was displeased by what was happening, and cursed both him who was crowning and him who was being crowned, and those who approved of these actions. Even the weather, contrary to nature, suddenly became on that day gloomy and lightless, filled with implacable cold in the autumnal season, clearly signifying the man's future surliness and unbearable oppression, especially towards those who had chosen him. The next day, taking along some of the patricians, he went up to the imprisoned empress, as was he wont, a spurious benignity through which, indeed, he had deceived nearly everyone. He offered his excuses to her, namely that he had been elevated against his will to the throne, for which he had no desire, and he cursed the men who had raised him up while plotting against her, just as Judas had betrayed the Lord after dining with him. Indeed, he testified that they had imitated Judas in all respects. Showing also his black buskins, he affirmed that he liked to wear them contrary to imperial custom. Deceitfully, he urged her, under oath, to have no misgivings about her every bodily comfort, such as a mistress might expect from her servant, and not to consider her fall a misfortune. He also urged her not to conceal from him any of the imperial treasures, and condemned the vice of avarice, which he himself was unable to contain for he was terribly afflicted with it, all devourer that he was, and placed all his hopes in gold. For her part, the wise and God-loving Irene, though she ought to have been overwhelmed by the misfortune of her sudden change, especially since she was a woman, said with a brave and prudent mind to him, who but yesterday had been a perjured slave, and today was an evil, rebellious, and impudent usurper. For my part, my good man, I consider God my helper and avenger, who raised me 
when aforetime I had left an orphan, and elevated me, unworthy though I was, to the imperial throne. The cause of my downfall I attribute to myself and to my sins, and I cry out, in all things and in every manner, may the name of the Lord be praised, the only King of kings and Lord of lords. The manner of your elevation I also ascribe to the Lord, without whom I am convinced nothing can happen. You are not unaware of the rumours against you, true ones, as the consummation of the events has proved, that have often been referred to me concerning the dignity with which you are now invested. Had I been carried away by them, I could have put you to death without hindrance. But partly because I trusted your oaths, partly in order to spare you, I disregarded many of my well-wishers in this case, too, referring my affairs to God, through whom kings reign and the mighty rule the earth. So now, too, inasmuch as you are pious and have been appointed by him, I do obeisance to you as to an emperor, and I beseech you to spare my weakness and to allow me the mansion of Eleutherios that I have built to console me of my incomparable misfortune. He replied, If you wish this to happen, swear to me by all the heavenly powers not to conceal any part of the imperial treasures, and I will fulfil your request and do everything for your comfort and repose. She swore to him upon the holy and living cross, saying, I will not conceal anything from you, down to the last penny, which indeed she did. Nicephorus was proclaimed emperor on the 31st of October, 802, in the church of Hagia Sophia. Irene was banished to the island of Principo, to the monastery she had built. She was later banished to Lesbos, after being implicated in a plot with Aetius to restore her to the throne. She died a year later, in August 803. While often recriminated for blinding her son, the historian Warren Treadgold gave her a positive assessment, highlighting that she was an intelligent, ambitious and capable ruler who could inspire loyalty among the people, clergy and the army. She was one of the only Isaurian emperors to have an active interest in Italy. She greatly expanded the empire's domains in Thrace and reconnected the Thessalonian enclave to Constantinople. The front in the east had its fair share of wins and losses, but more importantly, the groundwork had been set for the reintegration of Greece into the empire. She restored the icons and sponsored learning centers, which in time produced a revival of the empire's culture with new literature and better education. The administration and also the economy continued to grow and develop. Despite her shortcomings, the empire was in a better state than when she gained control of it in 780, and as the 8th century closed and the 9th century began, she had at least contributed to the revival of the Byzantine Empire. Thank you very much for watching, and this has been Eastern Roman History.